And our next to last word of the day is Red Timberlake. Which one? There we go. Um, thank you very much. I uh, had a wonderful day. I agree with everyone except the professor with the uh, turtleneck. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, I really agree with him the most. He was really sharp. Thank you. Uh, it was a very wonderful day for me. Um, what we're going to talk about here is a technique of military instruction in the Marine Corps. Uh, they say, tell me, you can tell them, tell them, and tell them, and hold them. Uh, I don't know if I get there or not. Uh, we came up with some key things here based on uh, our war experiences, which is essentially harvest the best from everything and leave the rest. You know, make the transition clean, don't leave stuff behind, but do leave stuff that uh, you don't need. Uh, one of the issues there, of course, was in my OSD office. Uh, I had many portfolios, but I did not have this one, thank God. But we had an energizer bunny retired Navy captain who was a sorcerer's apprentice, and he got the portfolio to produce MRAPs. And lo and behold, my office, lo and behold, as I speak to you today, we have spent $52 billion and delivered 22,000 MRAPs to the Middle East, of which we're cutting them up for scrap. So that's how America can spend some defense money if we don't pay attention to what we're doing. Um, I'm going to tell you about lessons learned from Yuma, Fallon, and Nellis. As I deep dive on each lesson, don't assume the other, other operating areas or other ranges aren't doing the same, but I just want to highlight uh, what they told me on their ranges as a, as a lesson learned for your use, because you, you'll come to grips with what they're grasping. <clears throat> Uh, this is exactly right, and I want to use what I call Z-axis research on showing you a new R&D vector to take the F-35 uh, in a different direction. Uh, applied physics is just cute. Uh, a lot of the theory that went into uh, the new way of war, the new thinking, uh, really is theoretical. We're now at the applied physics part of it, the difference between you get out and you go to the lab and make it work. Uh, practical consequences, and then the way ahead. Okay. First thing is, above that is both Brian and I work for Mike Wynn, brilliant man, kind of Billy Mitchell of his era. Uh, Gage fired him, a great tragedy, I think, the world of Mike. And he had a wind doctrine, which is great. If you're in a fair fight, someone failed in planning. And that's how we worship it. <laughs> and I love it. The second one is, before you get to no platform fights alone, is remember, all military technology is relative against a reactive enemy. Maybe a nuke is absolute, but I doubt even that because you have the different yields. But everything is relative, which means everything's changing and everything's action reaction cycle. Okay, fine. No platform fights alone. We're learning that in a big way. I wanted to try and figure out how not to be just F-35 centric, but to first to describe to you the 21st century environment that we're all in right now. And I had to come up with Tron Warfare. I came up with it mainly because I'm probably old and stupid, which is probably at certain areas true, uh, because when I came in on board, we had command. And then all of a sudden, we had command control. And then we had CQ. And then we had C4. And then we had C4 ISR. And then we had C5 ISR. Each C added, by the way, somebody made kernel. And doing that, we then had EW, but we had ECM. And then we had ECCI, and then, oh my god, we have Pulse, and then we had Signals in Space, and then we had Encryption, and then we had the Crippies, and then we had Directed Energy, and all of that, I figured, hell, I'll just call it Tron Warfare. Use that as my overarching term, and put the various components in it, and describe it down to the cascading element of what I just said. And maybe it'll make clarity, or maybe it'll muddy it up, I don't know. Um, but I'll give you one example. I'm sitting here at my desk, and oh, the, as Robin said, the commandos typing away Wall Street Journal, the era of man, and they were sexist, or the era of piloted, they weren't. Aircraft is over. It's all UABs. I called them drones because I shot them down. I said drone to Deptula once, he's a good friend. He said, don't dare call them drones. Well, I'm here to tell you, some of you guys shot down drones. We know that. They were targets. However, we call them UK. Again, my problem. UAVs, UKS, whatever. Here's the deal. They said definitively that that is the future of aviation, and it's not. It's part of the future of aviation. It, it, it's a building block. Why did I lead with that? 
because the reason why is, and this is, this is a little bit of a diversion from where I'm going with this, but I made a case a couple of years ago on the MRAPS example. You better get in front of these decisions before the sorcerer's apprentice turn on the spigot and walk out of the house. The next thing you know, the house is washed away because no one walks in to turn it off. And I said, you better darn well test this stuff and give it a robust, noble BS test against UAVs, kinetic killers, us, we shot at them, Tron warriors, what does that mean? Uh, I don't know, EMPs, uh, you know, uh, uh, in interdictions with various uh, ways in which you can throw Trons at it, uh, you can do electronic warfare, you can do EMP, or cyber. The simple reason is UAVs are nothing more than data link in space. That's all they are. Uh, they have a significant vulnerability. I don't know who will win that fight. But I was at the Mitchell Institute and had the three star Air Force General in charge. And I asked my question, and I said, you really haven't tested this yet, have you, General? He said, no, that's Senator that Flair, we should do that. Well, I'm here to tell you, I think something's happening right now. I think we are in a major step up of Tron warfare. I think you're seeing it right now, in addition to information warfare. I think when the Russians send bombers out, or ships afloat, or the Chinese announce an ADIS, uh, overlapping, by the way, the South Korean ADIS, and the Japanese are scrambling more times than they did at the height of the Cold War. All of a sudden, the world is on this new information quest for signals in space, location of uh, target grids, uh, aim points, uh, lock-on potential. All this stuff is heating up. It's heating up right here. This is one of the brown centers of that kind of thing. In doing so, uh, I have to stop for a bit of an advertisement in one respect against bad behavior because uh, I like ejection seats. I ejected, it worked. Uh, I feel bad for the command pilots who are flying a, 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 an intelligence aircraft with an air crew that they're responsible for in the back. And all of a sudden they look out the window and yeah, some SU-27 hot dog who may be a ham-fisted plumber comes screaming at them and they don't know what's gonna happen. And that would bother me if I was sitting there because I'm an ejection seat. So that's happening. And I'm here to tell you, and I'll, I'll go on my speech in a minute, but uh, I'd like to answer using the great warrior princess of American uh, television and comedy, Joan Rivers. I don't know if you know who she is or not, but Joan Rivers has a very sharp tongue. She came out of New York, very smart, she died recently. <clears throat> when she was faced with incredible stupidity, she had a great catchphrase, grow up. So please, I'm sitting there, and this, you, this, this chowder head comes screaming at me, this SU-27, I'd love to scream to him and channel Grobo. We know the game in Tron Warfare. We know how to probe. We've played it during the cold. There are rules. English fair play. You know, you just do it. That's how it works. Don't overstep the line and hurt somebody. You know, we saw what happened with ED3. So let's not have another one of those. That's my advertisement. Okay, moving right along, uh, we're gonna move <coughs> off that. There is an S-cube revolution. Now, I'm going to make kernel again, or whatever. Uh, presidential. Sensor, stealth, and speed. That's the formula I think we're going to address here. That's why I asked the question of Chip very simply. Operation Chimichanga. Sensors, stealth, speed. They had a sensor in the lead. It sensed something. It was a stealth aircraft. And it can impart speed to the weapon. However, in certain situations, you don't need that. You can play these permutations and combinations off. I'll give you a perfect example. What we have is a revolution coming, and it's called hypersonic cruise missiles. One of our leading uh, theoretician and practical scientists is the chief scientist of the Air Force, Mark Lewis, who is the world's leading expert on hypersonics. He's a genius. Actually. He left when, when I never left. Mark said we're within five years of the hypersonic. I'm not talking Aurora, I'm not talking Aircraft. I'm talking the hypersonic cruise missile that comes screaming at you at a mile a second, English measure. That's pretty fast. So here's the deal. Pretend that the, you know, the hypersonic revolution is on us. You have them, you're going to sink everybody. You're going to wipe out airfields, you're going to hit beautiful targets and blow them the hell and back. Or if the bad guys have them, the reverse is true. Sensors, stealth, and speed. Well, for the hypersonic threat, you don't need the F-35 in stealth mode. 
It can go out there with ordnance swung under its wing and park itself, just like we did in World War II against kamikazes, as pickets. The Navy invented a term called chainsaw, which was when they were worried in the height of the Cold War, the, shoot the archer, not the arrow. Some of you have heard that and may remember it. What they decided to do was use the skill and cunning of the F-14 with the Phoenix missile, and they would park it out way out from the carrier. You would try and push, as the Australia will, the threat as far out as you can. You want reach, not range first. In doing that, what they did is they figured out they'd leave breakwater out of Norfolk, and they'd launch an attack from Rosy Roads, Caribbean, and they'd get it. Well, I'm here to argue that with the F-35, it didn't happen, you have to invent it. You put that sucker out there, and you refuel it, the Navy's learned to use F-18s to refuel F-18. Go figure. Or <laughs> Ospreys. But you get it, and you start building your chainsaw in the 21st century. Now, what's going to happen? A threat's coming at you at a mile a second. A lot of people are in furballs, mixing it up. A minute. In a mix up engagement is about time. It may sound short, but it's not. 80 seconds, 80 miles away, you got it. The F 35 can have a sensor. I'll tell you why. They were flying over Pax River, they picked up a rocket launch in Cape Canaveral. That's a big deal. So they can fine tune their sensors. Once they pick it up, they're operating at the speed of light. Hypersonic's only going a mile a second, speed of light's faster. You do not have to hit the cruise missile. You have to break the laminar flow, and the thing will beat itself to death like that. Because we had four of them, three of them failed, were gimbals, and it just shook itself to death. The fourth was the bull bull of success. So, so just, that is a different combination of sensor stealth and speed. The whole idea is to get that kind of technology out there on the field, on the field of battle, and link. ADA is critical. Robin mentioned the Korean Peninsula, or an article saying we should, really should replace the Army Four Star with an Air Force Four Star, and the U.S. Army hates me forever. In doing that, what I decided to do was really stress that the Army had the right answer for it, they just didn't know it, which is you want to populate the Pacific Islands. I think there's 9,000 islands and the Japanese area in 7,000, the Philippines are reversed, and a lot aren't created. You pour concrete. You move out Patriots, ADA, and Iron Dome. I will do not deep dog on Iron Dome. It worked, which is really a nice thing. I mean, it saved a lot of lives. You know, the Israelis, of course, always getting beat up. They had the Iron Dome, and the whole mm -hmm. thing was to not retaliate as much, because they weren't getting the casualties of the sandwich which were triggers. So I call it a lifesaver. Why don't you put it on the Korean DMC? The point being is, in the Balts and in the Arctic, uh, same principle can apply. You can get up in your F-35, as I gave a speech to the Air Force Association, their keynote, one of their keynote addresses, and I said, I'm going to fly in harm's way and aegis is my wingman. And I swear some of the Air Force guys right now, check on new Navy airplane name, named Aegis. <laughs> and it's a ship. <laughs> yeah. So the point being is, we have the ability and you all have the ability to link real deterrence, real, it's not threatening. ADA is a non-threatening deterrence uh, weapon. No one can get mad at you. I mean, they can cook up a reason, but they ain't get mad for anything. Anyway, so, so what you have is the F-35 goes into this. And, and I sat through John Boyd's lecture uh, twice. I, I had done some tactical work for net assessment on air power. And I was called out to the CIA by my friends. And they said, easy, we have a problem. Uh, we have a new division director. And we're going to run a major op against the Soviets. And I said, what are you going to do? They said, big deal stuff. Let's call Hollywood. And they said, here's what we've been told to do. Send our corporate operators in there and get a flight suit from all their squadrons. I said, why would you do that? Well, everybody knows the best pilots wear the best flight suits. And that way we can tell which squadron is the best squadron. I said, hell, half the big dealers I know don't wear underwear. <laughs> so the point being is, looking at flight suits ain't going to get this. So they asked me to do a, an assessment, real technical stuff. And I, I sat in on boys lecture twice, you know, three hours each time. <laughs> Brain. Oodaloop, we kind of beat that to, to death, except the decide act part. 
My argument is, oh, which was John's real construct in his mind to get the old canopy of the 86th <coughs> into the 16th. That was his real quest. He wanted mark one eyeball, good sight. The side act was piece of S. Well, side act, boom, pull hard. We studied piece of S curves during those years all the time. I gotta tell you, the Russians built some very capable aircraft. We all know that. And we built some too. So, so I took Boyd and I looked at the F-35 through that prism. And I said, wait a minute, the SA is really the OO, is the fusion cockpit coming in. So now, it's not like Mark one eyeball anymore. It's the way in which the airplane is, is giving you, and I'll give you these specific examples, information, threat, air air, ground air, target, uh, profile, et cetera, et cetera. So what you now have is each individual pilot is empowered as his own UDA, the side act. Generals want to be generals, admirals want to be admirals. That's going to be a culture change when the pilot at times has better SA than the command. And I heard from some F-22 guys, not, not Chip, that at times they, they were asking, mother may I of the AWACS when they had a better, better SA. So this is a dynamic you're all going to see if you go into the airplane. Um, this is the key of the whole thing, and I'll tell you why when we get to the Shared mission data. Active passive sensing. I'll tell you where I came up with that one. And then it's a tactical aircraft with strategic capabilities. What do I mean by that? We wrote a paper for Space News. Um, the Chinese pop a satellite. The US Navy goes out to show we can do the same thing. Jack of a pitching ship, boom, up goes the satellite, boom. Uh, the great comment made again from my office was MDA would have the headline if you hit the satellite, MDA kills satellite. If you miss it, US Navy misses satellite. <laughs> and sure enough, they won, the headline was MDA kills satellite. So, but the idea was you could do it. And that's the good. And training ranges, and I, I will predict, and I'll tell you why, that's a 10 year lead that we have right now. The battle of technology, gentlemen, ladies, is being won. It's a matter of political will to get in the field, but it, it, the vision is seen, and we're now not in the theoretical part of physics, but we're in the applied part, and, and, and that's where I think we should be. Okay, at, at Yuma, I go to Yuma, Mox, Marine. Let me tell you, I didn't go over the dark side. It's Tron warfare. I'm still at Harder Marine, so I read with great glee when some reporter went out in the field and wanted to look at Marines um, doing um, computer work. Some Lance Corporal is trying to type a computer with his fists. You know, it's not working. So the reporter goes up and says, well, Corporal, you're right, Lance Corporal, you're having trouble here. I said, yeah, but you know what? This battery makes one hell of a club. So deep down inside, I'm still a Marine. Bottom line, you get there, and what I found is with the uh, XO-121, who's now taken, I think, chips, command, great guy, um, he's telling, he's running a mission profile and in real time, and he's on range, he's got air to air, ground air threat, coming and going, following, tracking the target, and next thing you know, an EW <clears throat> threat pops up. He presses a button. Over. He's now his own EW warrior, and the Marines invented the EA-6. I mean, it's not like we don't know what it is, and we chose to go with the F-35. So I said, doesn't that really give you a, a, a signal that the F-35 is an F-A-E-35? Well, yeah, it kind of is, which is unique in aviation history. Okay. Then what we did is EW button press away. Here's where I think it will help the Australian equation and maybe the British equation. What we have to prove is, see, I'm drinking so What we have to prove is that we can communicate information into the Osprey, while well, we go on a thousand mile raid with the sole purpose of the existence of the United States Marine Corps, which is getting the infantrymen, or infantrymen, with a rifle on the ground to close with and engage the enemy. Everything else falls by the wayside. We're support, we have support, we know that. So what we're trying to do is, is create a network of how to take F-35 information and get it into an Osprey to be understood by a sergeant as he's going into combat. I'm here to tell you, that's a hard problem. But once you figure it out, a lot of other things will fall out from that. You know, getting the hands of an admiral ain't hard.
hard. You know, he'll understand that. So, so to take the information moving, information flow over time, distance, space, is a challenge. Are we up to it? Yeah, I think we are. I think we're task organized that way. <laughs> they've got the uh, Osprey Test Squadron out there, they've got Mott, and they've got the first IOC squadron, and, they, and that's the only reason why they exist. So, uh, the takeaway from Yuma was it's really an FAE, and they're working with the Army, well, the equivalent of the Army, our ground forces, to make it work to develop the companies. Uh, and we are after I'm saying insertion and withdrawal. These gentlemen are doing it, interesting people. I often get angry when they say we don't know what we're doing in maintenance, the F-35 is a hog. The Alice doesn't work. Tell it to the staff sergeant. He was with Harriers, and he picked, he used to work in Dog Davis' squadron, who's now DCS Air, and he's there, and this staff sergeant over there, he wants to write the maintenance manuals so his grandkids are proud. So not only the pilots leading the charge, the troops are engaged in the process. This is the Green Knights, it's uh, the replacement, or new CO for the Warlords. That's a Buford squad in the Marine. You, you guys have all been in here. No names. This is a transition guy, F-35 F, uh, guy. Up here, very interesting pilot. He was, we're, World War II training for the Osprey. And what do I mean by that? When the YDA got to England, some of the co-pilots had 30, 40 hours. Flying command time high. They're taking kids out of the command and putting them in the Osprey to learn. And they, they're operational. as co-pilot. He operated up in his town, and he was in Afghanistan, plane commander, and he inserted into a hot, quasi-hot LZ. But when they got there, he pulled out, and the Marines on the ground said, oh shit, he augered over here. They were dumped into both an IED, berm, and potential mines. That's a big deal. He says, okay, I'll come get you. Goes over, sits down, loads them up, takes them to a different part of the battlefield, says, go kill them from this angle. And they did it. So, so this guy is in Mons, and he's, and he's part of the F-30. This, this is the age. These are majors and captains, guys. That's where the innovation's coming from. It's not the old gray-haired guy. So anyway, that's, that was the Mons story, FAE, uh, button push away, integrate air, air and ground element. Okay, Nellis. Now we go to Nellis. Heart and soul ago, we say, Nellis, not Las Vegas. <laughs> Mission data set. We talked to the Air Force general in charge. That is where you're going to make your money. Why? Because the mission data set is a collection of all the threat elements combined into a file that you all will share. So you have uniformity of information on threats. The 400, the 300, you name it. The, I don't know, the 27, 30 MK, whatever. Uh, fire control radars, uh, Navy ships, if we're going to try and lock you up. That's a big deal because you'll have partnership in it. All of a sudden, you're co-equal. Oftentimes, and I came out of the intelligence community at times, there's a squirrel mentality. They're not, ooh, I'm going to carry it. I'm not them enough. That doesn't help anyone. This is driving it right here. And the Air Force knows that, and the commanding general who flies the 35 knows that. Okay, now, you're asking, uh, the, the general was asking about aggressors and, and things like that. I'm sitting there talking to the commander of the weapons school. You know, you guys in the Air Force, you're the only fighting force in the world that have the 22 and 35 now. Can you imagine the permutations, combinations you can do at Red Fly by mixing and matching stealth aircraft with legacy aircraft and all kinds of uh, scenarios for the first time ever because you have the, the type of equipment that can, can be put out in the field. You can develop various kinds of fighting against the cell force, against the fusion force, with a fusion force, with a legacy force. It's yours. Get the red flag. Watch what they're doing. Put yourself in the middle of it and learn something. Because if they're smart, and they are, it's outside of DC, so they're really smart. Stay <laughs> there and they will fly, they will give you a lot of information and they will help you along and make you part of the solution. And I think they, they have that attitude yet. Uh, I think the gentleman from China's here, I don't know if the Russian representative is still here, but quite frankly, uh, the Russian and PLAF can do this, they don't have the ranges, they don't have a fusion cockpit. It's a big surprise, they look and smell and wax like a 
F35 or a, uh, F22, but it ain't. It doesn't. Because you look at it. Just, when you see a 35, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the center of the nose, it's the wings, it's the chip will see it. I mean, just come on. So, so they don't have that yet. They don't have this low observable aircraft, 360 degree fusing cockpit. That makes all the difference. Now, go to the kill shot at the end, because that's a big deal. Okay, here are the guys doing it at the Air Force. That's the plane cap. That kid owns that airplane in his mind. That airplane will be the best airplane on that ramp, and that's how he thinks. And I'm here to tell you, that's the guy you want. This is the commanding general. He transitioned and flies the F-35, two-star. He is the one that's very proud of the mission data set. He's, he gets it. There's the delivery pilot. He was a 16 guy. And now he's flying the F-35. That's a big deal because the Air Force, even though, as Robin said, the, the purchasing of it and the rollout and all that, but you have some real good people. They're just coming in. So, so I'm very happy with the range aspects of Nellis and the F-35 on the mix and match capability. Now, we're going to Fallon. That's the heart and soul. Fallon was created because of a serious mistake. We created Fallon because after the <coughs> bombing, we sent a carrier strike through bin with A6s, and the A6s decided to loiter over a target to see if it was a semi-aircraft gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Two shoots, one, one didn't make it. A POW changed the course of that engagement. The Navy went to strike you, eventually moved top gun there, left Miramar. Big mistake on their part, because Miramar's great. Fallon, okay, but it's great ranges, and they're up there. Now, what they figured out, what I talked to them about, is they're doing the Gerald Ford integration, kind of. What they're also more importantly doing is they're doing video telecoms with the carrier in combat. And that's a big deal. Because when the Bush showed up to kill ISIS, do we strafe here, do we drop here? What do you think? They go back to the range, they strafe here, <coughs> here, do this, do that. It's real time learning. When I was talking to them, though, there were two data points I shared with the Adam, safety, right here. And that's the aggressive line, there's the E2, and there was the CO proton who's now running congressional liaison. I talked to him, I said, guys, I called the factory and talked to Mike Scaife. Who's Mike Scaife, you ask? He's an Air Force County grad, electrical engineer, who by his own admission was a very average F-16 pilot. He left the Air Force and became the cockpit design engineer for Lockheed Martin. He is the gentleman that any F-16 pilot in this room, if you see him, buy him a beer. He changed the switchology of the 16 and moved it up so that you wouldn't get the leans, the vertigo, or whatever. They liked it so much, that was 17 years ago, he designed the F-35 cock, uh, cockpit, and I talked to Satan, and I said, you know what? I talked to Scave. Two examples, Battle of Midway, Wade McCluskey trying to find the carriers, and they couldn't, they were gonna miss. This was a big deal, especially for the Australians, <laughs> a huge deal. He looks down, sees the destroyer making a wave. The heads up guy leading bombing six says that destroyer is racing back to the carriers. We turn orients the fleet, flies over in four minutes, smoking holes in the ocean, gone. World War II, for all practical purposes, is on the path to victory. A lot more people would die, but that was it, four minutes. All because he saw the, the destroyer wait and was smart enough to follow. The second thing, and this is what I was talking about El Dorado Canyon. My Rio and Greens, his brother was in the office department of Lake and Lake and Heath, excuse me. And uh, part of the planning cycle of El Dorado Canyon, to remind you, that's when he did the F-111 raid. All the way around Europe, stream raid, 11, there was one mic click in the entire raid. I hate to be that guy, but I don't think ever do that, did. But the point being is, for all practical purposes, it was a passive stealth raid, because Gaddafi can have raid by the same time. They got Dash 11, because in those days, Soviet doctrine was, hear a noise, point gun up, shoot. It must be Arab doctor now because it's take 8K, scream, shoot up in air, act like an idiot, but they still do it. Point being is, what that proved to me is you can do stealth. You can do stealth, passive attack. That is different, gentlemen. If you admit, remember Tron War, one of the sayings, Tron War, and I asked 
Afghan battlefield, Iraq battlefield, that's in Iraq, now Afghanistan <coughs> is you admit you die. Or you admit you die in the air sea battle. You know, you have something to shoot at. If you can figure out how to launch a passive grenade with the, the matrix of the attack aim points, that's a huge deal. Is it? They're going to start playing with that. Not bad. So that's a data point there. This is exactly what Chip Burke was talking about, which is I used to do the analysis. Performance over time was an XY curve, simply a measure of improved aircraft by range payload. Uh, payload is, by the way, was measured by systems inside or carried or both. Uh, maneuverability, piece of ass, John Boyd, and um, kind of maneuverability is piece of ass and it's speed. That clustered your generations until all of a sudden the F 35 came along. That is. This is XY, XY plot. The F-35 has introduced a new vector of aircraft design. It's the fusion vector. It may not seem much, but I'll show you how it really works. In doing that, the industrial base will shift from road to the riveter to computer labs and computer chips and algorithms as you upgrade systems. Why is that true? Z axis. Because here it is. That chart was developed because I saw the, the j chart, and they put DAS in the cockpit, and they had a typical military briefing chart of the lightning bolt, and the airplane, and the field, and I'm like, but it was wrong. It made no sense. Because DAS isn't in the middle. There are other systems in fusion. It looks complicated, I'll explain. So I called my friend Burbage, classmate, who had to run the program. I said, Tom, I'm not a graphic engineer, but the charts all don't come. So he said, OK, call this young lady and she'll do the chart for you. Ring, 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 hello, I'm Ed. Tom said, I'm gonna call you. Oh yes, uh, give her name, I don't know what it was. Mary, um, in the middle of my wash cycle, can I switch it out? Oh, okay. She was doing her work. She was home. In about an hour and a half, we came up with that. If you'll see, this really, in my opinion, captures the focal point of the F-35 for industry. It's a big deal. Each of the systems has its own R&D vector. So if your if you're industry, and this is your area, right here, play on. Come to it, look at a solution set, the pilots will tell you whether it works or not, and all of a sudden, you'll start to feed it because it's going to be upgraded. Simple, not hard. The second thing it'll do, the law of intelligence is very simple, information moves up and out. <coughs> Notice I have that there. It moves up into the cockpit, whether it goes out or not, depends on whether you back or pass. If he's sitting, or she is sitting in the cockpit, and it's active, then you link and you go horizontal. That's going to change the hub spoke. Uh, and nothing against AWACSs, I can give you the rationale for them in the future, but I think what you're going to see is a dynamic change over time in the command of the air battle, where all of a sudden, air battle leaders have to recognize that there's a horizontal spider web at work with interconnected information, and not the old GCI approach whatever that means. And the Soviet approach was a complete failure. So, so you're getting that. So here's, here's the data talking points. Best real-time knowledge, language agnostic, because it's all little displays. Fusion engine focuses IR&D, R&D, and drives, remember, SQ, the sensor, stealth, and speed. The speed can be in your weaponization of the aircraft. And if you're sitting here in Denmark and you invent the magic kill weapon, you can sell it to the consortium. I mean, there's great opportunity for industry to buy into this thing. Because you can mix and match the various skill sets of the various countries to get the best possible product. That's a big deal. Finally, uh, as I said, it's a global industry on where to go with R&D, uh, competitive consortiums, Air battle management is going to change. Uh, it'll be hard, but it'll happen. And the UDA is the same concept with different applications. It is my working hypothesis that the squadron pilot will drive this, ultimately. I'll be long gone, and they will figure it out because they'll be sitting in the cockpit and they'll be figuring something out. Now, here's the ultimate issue. If, if you believe that the TF-50 and the J-20 and the J-21 are successful stealth. Without a fusion cockpit, you can look at it and make your own decision. I don't think they have it. 
and one F-35, like the CNO says, eventually stealth will wear out, anything that moves through space can be seen or felt or heat, it will be found, eventually. Who knows when? I, I buy it just a few cockpit, by the way. But the point being is, once one F-35 in the world gets a validated print of the 50, the 20, or the 31, it is nothing more than a fourth gen aircraft. Because it's no longer stealthy, the 35 thing. Presto, changeo, obsoleso, gone up. Uh, you have a lot of them, but you can get them. And I predict sometime in my lifetime, I plan to live at least 10 years, that that little blip will be found, whether it's a training mission up here in the Baltics, Japanese Scramble, Korean, or Marine IOC, or Navy afloat, they will see it. And boy, that is amazing. Because you'll end up all the countries have the same information. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a Tron revolution that incorporates everything. We've talked about empowering legacy red flag. We've talked about EW at Yuma. We've talked about the active passive attack capability. And we talked about the R&D vector for industry and the reorganization and the form, fit, and function against the probably the biggest threat coming, which is hypersonic cruise missile. There it is. Squadron pilots. I vote for them, not me. I really do. They're going to figure out this. Yeah. I was there once. I got bored and I was, you know, screwing around with the things if I could do it. So I hope that was uh, enjoyable. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. We're going to have a lot of QA, I hope. So, Robin, come on up. Hey, <laughs> Oh, forgot to tell you. Ah, I'm sorry. I think the Norwegians are gone. This was Chip's Squadron. This was my first squadron in the world famous Warlords. I'm sure you've heard this. <laughs> We're water skiing after a hot dead deployment at Key West, which chased the ugly Cubans away with cowards, because they had to shoot down unarmed airplanes. So we're back water skiing, having a great time, and the skipper calls, and it's a frost call. And we go, what the hell's that? So we put our flight suits over our bathing suit, play September, we show squatter on Sunday, and he said, you guys are going to North. Ran away to North. Oh, great, where's that? Oh, the way up here. Holy shit, how do we get there? Well, find out if you have tankers. No tankers. Find out if you have Arctic survival water. Arctic survival water. Is the water cold? Yes. Okay, well, fly up to Goose Bay, fly over Greenland, keep going, hit Iceland, go north. Okay, boop, 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 we're up on the way. America didn't particularly care for me at that point. We were in anti-war mode, they didn't particularly care what we were doing. We get to Norway, and we are the sky gods we thought we were. The Norwegians were so kind to us. They were so decent. They turned out. They had a party for us, many parties. They were just great people. And I want, I'm sorry they're gone, but I want to say thank you. Even though I got up in the morning and had a heart attack and put fish paste on it, we didn't want to brush our teeth with it or eat it, but we ate it. But we flew the fjords and it was a beautiful flying ever in my life, my phone never worked. So thank you to Scandinavia. <laughs> <laughs>